Thank you for joining today's webinar of Vault Free, Cobalt Free Radio Surgery Technology Review and Clinical Experience at the Swiss Neuro Radio Surgery Center. The RSS would like to thank um, our ZAP Surgical Systems for supporting this webinar through an unrestricted educational grant. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator, Dr. Pantalea Romanelli. Dr. Romanelli is the Scientific Director for Brain Radio Surgery at the Centro Diagnostico Italiano in Milan, Italy. He is also Chief Medical Officer at AV Medica and is a leading scientist of the neuroscience research projects at the European Synchrotron Research Facility in Grenoble, France. He received his medical degree summa cum laude at the Sicon University of Naples, Italy, and completed fellowship training in epilepsy surgery, functional neurosurgery, and stereotactic radio surgery at the New York Medical College, New York University, and at Stanford University. He is currently professor of the biomedical technologies by the Italian National Authority. He has subscribed four patents on wireless brain signal transmission using medical devices. He's authored more than 70 publications and was awarded the Pioneer Medicine Award from the Society of Brain Mapping and Therapeutics. Welcome, Dr. Romanelli. Thank you, Joanne. So it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Mack for, uh, for this webinar. Uh, I just need to do a small correction because I'm not with Habimedica anymore uh, for the last couple of years. So um, perhaps I sent um, a CV that needs to be updated. All the rest is correct. So I will, uh, I will proceed to introduce Dr. Uh, Dr. Mack. Dr. Mack, uh, uh, got his uh, PhD in physics at the University of Tübingen. He has been a CEO at uh, radiosurgical centers in uh, in Swiss for uh, for uh, for a long time, with a long experience, uh, starting uh, from from the early 2000s. And um, after uh, running a cyber knife center for uh, for several years, he's now implanting. Uh, he just implanted the. Uh, uh, the new cobalt free volt free zap system so um, please dr mack we would be so interested to hear your experience uh with uh, this uh, zap installation in switzerland so please go ahead you all thank you very much for this kind introduction it's a pleasure for me to be here i hope all of you understand me well yes you hear we hear you well we do. I'd like to lead you through the presentation by using following topics. I would like to remind us all on the basics of radiosurgery. Then I want to continue with dedicated devices for intracranial radiosurgery, focus on the technology concerning SEP. Then uh, continue with the treatment procedure, then focus on some indications, followed by some QA measures, what we need concerning uh, dedicated constructional requirements, and then try to find a summary. I think we all know uh, basics of radiosurgery, and I don't want to go through all the points, but I think Lance Lexel was one of the main pioneers and I know from his son, from Danny, that the motivation back in the 1950s to develop um, a dedicated radiosurgical device was given since the risk for mortality was up to 40% at that time at Karolinska. So he defined the need for radiosurgical device by saying the delivery of a single high dose of radiation to a small and critically located intracranial volume through the intact skull. So if we just look back what happened in the last century, there has been a lot of development going on. So the first urotactic frames in neurosurgery were already developed in 1908, followed by Stereotactic neurosurgery in humans by Spiegel, Weikis, and Excel in the 1940s. Then the first experiments from Lexcel with an X-ray tube, 1950s. Then 
some developments in Berkeley with uh, protons and helium ions. Then again, uh, Larsen and Lexel with um, the prototype using protons in 1954. Then uh, Kjellberg and Köhler um, in Harvard using uh, protons for radio surgery. Again, Lexel and Larsen with the gamma knife prototype in the 1960s. Then the first U model uh, at the Karolinska in 1975. The first approaches with the LINAC by Betty and Darren Shinsky in 1982. Then an interesting concept by, by Beauvoir in Gainesville by decoupling uh, the LINAC by the use of a floor stand, which made it available to uh, gain high uh, accuracies concerning the ISIS center. Um, and then the further developments of gamma knife versions. And then in the end of the 19th, the idea of John Adler, who has had an education at the Karolinska, where he found that it was necessary to have a machine using the principles of radio surgery for the complete body. So he developed the first robot supported radio surgery. Then further versions of the gamma knife, then the first idea of using a rotating LINAC uh, with a tomotherapy, then different versions of the cyber knife from 2010 up to now. And then again, John Adder with the first gyroscopical radio surgery SEPX device. Uh, about which I would like to give you a talk today. Uh, another nice approach which I want to, to mention is I was in Japan and I was uh, surprised on the many uh, dedicated uh, devices concerning gamma knife and cyber knife in, in Japan and, and they also use an approach uh, called or neutron capture therapy. So the idea is to selectively enrich the tumor cells with Bohr 10, then irradiate this uh, cell cells with slow thermic neutrons. And by doing this, splitting the Bohr 10 nucleus into an alpha particle into a lithium ion. And the nice thing about this chain reaction is that the range of the reaction products is approximately within the cell dimensions. So you have, you gain a very high LET and thus a high RBV, and that means you need less dose. So it's a binary therapeutic concept because the first part is an enrichment uh, by and with Bohr 10 and then a radiation with new charms. So putting all together, this is the basic idea on, on uh, radio surgery. So the principle of fractionation, the classical division of the dose into many sessions due to the fact that different tissues react differently sensitive to radiation is replaced by portioning the dose into many geometric contributions. Radio surgery is mostly given in one fraction. So the portioning of the dose into many geometric individual beams is the difference. We want to have or achieve extremely steep dose falloffs at the edge. So we have gain a high dose and a high BD and thus a high tumor control. Limitations are if the volume is too large, we have toxicity, we have malignant processes, According to LQ model, radio service maybe not the perfect idea, and strongly differing alpha and beta values for tumor and surrounding tissue are also maybe a challenge. So, if we look at these graphs, which are all familiar to us, the idea would be have the chance to give enough dose in one session to gain a high tumor control on the one side, not uh, causing side effects on the other. That means we have a, th a certain therapeutic window which we can use. And we all know this graph at the down left side. We want to achieve a dose distribution coming from the outside with very low dose until the tumor starts and have a steep dose rising to the tumor and at the end of the tumor, steep dose fall off again. And the matter of, of quality is dependent on the device, technique, and dose planning. 
We want to achieve maximum conformity and the maximum dose gradient. The goal is to reduce the dose to half within roughly two to three millimeters. And how can we achieve these high dose gradients? It, the main factor responsible for this is the penumbra. It's simply a geometric problem. If you look at the source size, you look at the distance from the source to the lesion, it, it's clear that if the distance is rather big, you develop a high shadow which you don't want to have. That means what has an influence is the source to surface distance, the distance from the collimating systems to the target, the source size, and the quality of collimation, leakage, degree of focusing, etc. And if you look on the main representatives who deal with radio surgery, if you look at the conventional LINAC, you have a focal spot about 1.3 millimeter, a rather high distance from um, the source to uh, the lesion and from the collimating system to the lesion. And if you look at the cyber knife, it's a little bit smaller. If you look at the gamma knife, you have already a strongly reduced SAD and collimator access distance and with a zap it's roughly the same. That's the reason why I put the boundary. So these are the dedicated radio surgical intracranial surgery systems and these are the more universal systems. We all know from the daily routine that we always have to add a certain diagnostic uncertainty to the tumor and if the tumor is moving and further um, safety seem concerning to movement. We all have the feeling that nothing is moving in the brain, but if you look at this video, which I just want to turn on. It's not working. Okay, I continue. So radiation physics plays an interesting role. We only can use 5% of the energy because only 5% we can use to ionize the atoms. 95% of all the energy is converted into heat and vibration, so we cannot use this. Together with um, formation of highly reactive free radicals in chemistry and concerning the direct breaking of molecular bond and single or double strand breaks, we can achieve a destruction of the tumor, all effects leading to an overall biological effect. So what are the optimization criteria? We all know that we need to gain a high conformity index or a conformity index. That means down here we have the perfect match and up here it's much and there we have mismatches so I think that is clear. But the second which comes or plays a dominant role is a gradient index. That means is how close can we squeeze the dose mesh to the tumor. Now looking at the dedicated devices for intracranial radio surgery, the left hand side you see the gamma knife with the 192 sources arranged around the unit center point all emitting rays at the same time. And in the middle you see the gyroscopic suspension of the LINAC at the Z. That means the geometry is rather similar. You have the main axis along and parallel to the couch and then you have a oblique axis um, tilted by 45 degrees and both axes have shells which are moving inside each other and Within the inner shell, the LINAC and the X-ray system is mounted. So if you look at the spectrum which is used, again, there's a similarity between, between the gamma knife and the ZAP because the gamma knife is using cobalt-60 emitting um, with the same intensity at 117 and 133 MeV. Um, delivering roughly 1.25 MeV. And if you look at the 3 MV LINAC with a 
the maximum energy of 3 MV, it will have uh, the strongest incident at roughly one third of this maximum energy, delivering a spectrum of roughly 1 MeV, which is not that far away. So again, concerning the Breen quality, we have a similarity. We also have a multi-isocentric approach. That means the lesion will be kind of covered by so-called isocenters or by spheres. And that means that the target is kind of pushed or pulled through the intrinsic focus of the machine. So every so-called shot or sphere is put together of a variety of beams. Every single beam um, delivering only a small part of energy, but where in the area where all the beams intersect, we have enough reaction to cause effects which we would like to have. And so you can optimize concerning the collimation, the exposure time, the weighting of the shots, and concerning the overall treatment time. The tracking methods are in analogy to the cyber knife, so you can track according the skull-based algorithm, which takes into account the radius of the curvatures of the bones, and the adjustments are made according uh, to the DRRs, which you have re um, constructed uh, due to the primary AK and CT. You can correct for the translations and two rotations. So this is um, the machine, and it's in a, in a side view. So this would be the axle gantry, to which is everything is is, is mounted. You see the gimbaled oblique scantry with the Linux down here. This is the shielded treatment sphere weighing 20, 28 tons. The patient is lying on a couch. With the imaging detector and the KV tube to control for the positioning of the patient and then compared to the data by the primary taken CT. We have the collimator with a LINAC and the collimator wheel up here. The shielded rotary shell, which closes everything as soon as the patient is inside the machine. You have a detector for dose monitoring. So the, here you have the collimator with the wheel and you have the different diameters Four, between 4 and 25 millimeters, and there's one situation where you have a plug. That means you can block the beam. The, the drills are conically drilled. That means you have very, very little scatter within the collimator wheel. So this is a simplified geometrical breath representation. And that means since the Linux is mounted in the inner shell, and the inner shell again is Kind of moving around the basic axis, you have 1,800 positions multiplied by nine collimator positions, and that leads more than 16,000 combinations which you can use. So this would be the situation. You have certain node positions will, which will be addressed by the LINAC during the therapy, and the sub target will be moved through the given intrinsic focus unit center point of the dedicated system. And after you have kind of treated one isocenter, the couch is going to move to the next part of the lesion, and then you start all over delivering the dose to this part of the lesion. This is the and to verify the calculated dose in real time uh, with MV imaging, and it gives you a, a feeling on how big are the deviations between the pre-calculated dose and what you actually indicated. So I hope. I don't know why it's not working. Just tested it, but it's not working. You could try to hit play one more time. Uh, 
So I'm sorry. This is strange. May I continue? So the treatment procedure begins with imaging. So we have to make a mask. The mesh is heated up and pulled in a soft state over the head to the table and fixed in place. We'll have a CT with the mask and we'll have an MRI without the mask because we can't squeeze the patient with the mask into the head coil. But the MRI scans will be co-registered with a CT with a mask. So this would be the situation in the planning system. So you have the CT with the MRI and then the planning process would continue. So in this case, we'd have an acoustic neuroma and this would be the multi-isocentric approach. So you uh, semi-automatically place the shots and then you get these isodose lines. Now on the right hand side you see a mesh representation of, of the spheres and this is a simplified presentation of the beams matching in these points. So as soon as the dose planning is finished, the patient will be fixed, mounted with the mask to the table, lying on a headrest, be moved in this unit center point and then the shell would close there would be an x-ray couple of uh, images these would be uh, compared to the reconstructions taken before from the ct and if the patient is in the right position the application of those can continue and the follow-up ideally would um, be performed at the same scanner the same sequences to perform exact volumetry. So concerning indications, it's mainly the same indications uh, as with all the other um, radiosurgical devices. We have benign brain tumors, uh, vestibular schwannoma, meningioma, pituitary, urinoma, glomusugulare tumors, then malignant brain tumors, the metastasis, glioblastoma in a situation of recurrence, chondrosarcoma, cordoma, eye tumors will be the field melanoma, and malformations mainly the AVMs and functional trigeminal. So if we start with um, the vestibularis schwannome, and this is a planning which we performed many years ago at an, another device, we would like to gain steeper dose gradients to the cochlea, that would be ideal. Second, we would like to have very steep dose gradient to the facial nerve in front here. We would like to avoid symptoms, paresis or salivation. And we would like to achieve maybe some cold spots along this profile because we have the feeling if we can manage to allow the, the the nerve have some colds for some reliefs along its way through this channel, there would be a chance for a long hearing preservation. That is our feeling. And we observe, depending on this high dose rate, that maybe the temporary swelling phenomenon can, um, can appear a little bit earlier than compared with a machine with uh, a smaller dose rate. So this would be a vestibular schwannoma plant with a zap. It's very, very um, dose and uh, narrow following isodose lines. We have an example of a pituitary. Mostly we have the neurosurgeons take out um, part of the tumor uh, before and they leave uh, a residual amount for for us for intracranial rate of surgery. This is something we would want to uh, address now in in a study that we instead of irradiating the tumor bed 
after resection, we would like to have a pre-resection radiosurgery, uh, means that we perform radiosurgery of the solid tumor and afterwards open surgery, and then we have no cell entrainment by surgery, and we hope that we can achieve good clinical results. Uh, we have found out that approximately 14% of all the patients can gain the long-term survival uh, five to seven years if we um, if they undergo regularly follow up and we can continue with um, several radiosurgical treatments and with almost no cognitive deficits. That would be a metastasis with the Z um, with all the narrow and closed isodose lines again. This is the glioblastoma where we would like to, but that's too early for us, would like to follow the approach by Christopher, uh, who tried to, after open surgery and after classical radiotherapy of the tumor, but tried to form radiosurgery along the propagation directions defined in flare. And he reached excellent results being superior to the classical stoop scheme. So that is very, very interesting. And we try to learn how this can be performed. I think that would be a very interesting perspective for these patients. Real melanoma is an interesting case. This is a case which we have performed at a gamma eye for many, many years. And we now want to achieve this uh, with this uh, mask system, this um, fixation system. And uh, we have a by Oraya size, a lens system, a suction cap, which is put directly on the eye lens, and you can evacuate this by a small pump. So you would need no retrobobert anesthesia, you need no frame, and you need no candelum clips, which you need if you send the patients to the proton. So we're very, very curious how this will work out. ABMs, as you know, it's mostly um, a challenging thing in uh, defining correctly the nidus, and it's a very complication, uh, very complicated situation. The higher the dose, the higher the obturation. The higher the dose, the higher the induced side effects. The higher the dose, the less risk of bleeding and the bleeding function of age. So it's a complicated uh, back and forth, and there are several concepts of staging if the volumes are too big concerning dose and volume. And you have to do something because if you do nothing, the bleeding risk untreated is somewhere between two and 4% per year. By Gaminol, we have um, up to now seven cases, out of which six um, give us a feedback that uh, they have strong pain relief, which is a good sign. We always have situation between medications, trinetta surgery, thermocoagulation, and radiosurgery. And we follow the same approach as probably most of the centers that we would like to give. Between 1885 gray, close to the brain stem, because we also feel that in this region there is probably the best situation concerning the to relief, uh, to, to gain a pain relief. Um, the concept of treating along the trigeminal nerve is rarely practiced because it does not deliver better results. And the idea is that um, we would like to damage the axon because then it cannot perform its function anymore and would like to have some kind of a partial necrosis and both effects would have an impact on the physiology and lead to 80% pain relief by the same time, probably a percentage of 7% of numbness and would probably, according to literature, need repeated therapy in 20 to 23%. And these would be an example of a dose planning for trigeminal. Please note that the red line is only the four gray line and since the brainstem can accept something between 10, 12, 14 gray, 
we are in a very, very comfortable situation here. Uh, concerning QA, I think we all have to face the problem that we need to take into account all these limbs, mechanical accuracy, the positioning of the patient, the biology, those calculation, target definition, locate, and the imaging. I think imaging is very, very important. And we try to keep the overall accuracy somewhere small, shortly below one millimeter. And we have several phantoms to achieve this concerning the images. We have several positions in phantoms where we exactly know the geometric coordinates. Try to find that out in a planning system. And we, in the wrong color representation, we get the feeling where the rods are not exactly uh, represented. And then we go to the application manager, which will help us to tune the sequences. We have some uh, special phantom head phantoms. We have some Test inserts where we can insert film, and you see in this case that the small artificial lesion, eight times four times four millimeter, the exact dose distribution you can find on the film with an absolute dose measurement that you not only hit the target exactly, but you can also verify the dose which you gave. And this would be for an acoustic neuroma if you have a film sandwich, it would be really try to uh, verify the dose distribution. Something concerning constructional requirements, um, you need rather high and, and a big room to bear the machine and you need additional space beneath the ground um, and you need uh, static building measures to carry these 28 tons. So you need a bit below the ground you do not need special radiation protection due to the self-shielding construction of the machine. So this is a situation in our building. And here you see there is a lid in the ceiling so we could lift the machine from the top into the bunker. So this is a cut. You see the lid with the machine. In the ceiling, you see where the lid was opened, bringing the machine. Dimensions for the room are roughly 10 meters times 7 times 3 in height and 28 tons weight on the pit. You need air conditioning cooling to cool the linen. So, trying to find a summary, I think the importance of radio surgery has changed. Has gained importance. The classical principle of temporal proportioning the dose into different sensitivity of tissue of radiation is being replaced by geometric portioning of the dose into many individual beams. I think higher resolution imaging is absolutely essential. The better the imaging, the lower necessary margins, the overall accuracy of the system plays the overriding role. The scientific data in radio surgery is documented in many ways, there are so many millions of patients treated with a gamma knife and more than 300,000 with a cyber knife. There are a vast mass of papers which document um, and that the, the efficiency of this method. Summing up the factors which which faces SAP X technology. It's a convincing concept by using elements of gamma knife and cyber knife. It's very precise. It's dedicated for intracranial radio surgery. It's already mature concerning the hardware, uh, which was developed by SAP and partially with the Varian. It's a multi isocentric radiation principle, high dose gradients to a low penumbra and thus so delivering a very low out-of-field dose, uses magnetic drives, complex flange technologies. The first results at our center from approximately seven patients are promising, although no long-term results are still available. You have to take into account you need enough space for bearing the machine and technical equipment, and by seven by three meters, you need enough space for the pit beneath the ground level so it's five 
times almost three times 1.5 meter in addition. And you need to make sure that it can carry 28 tons. No extra shielding in the sense of a classical bunker, since the machine is self-shielding. And you need no safeguarding measures since there's no OVOL 60 used. Now there's one tracking algorithm, skull based available, and the sphere packing has to be performed mainly manually for the moment. I think the main argument for us to uh, go here is that complete center is integrated into a neuro institute, neuroscience institute. The constellation is unique because all necessary disciplines are on, under one roof. We have neurology, neurosurgery, neuroradiology, radiology, and physics. And scientifically, we are linked to the neurosurgical faculty of the University Hospital of Basel. And we're supported by Hilsland and Endomine Center for Microsurgery and the Trimley Eye Clinic. And I want to especially say thank you to our fantastic team uh, we would have had no chance if they would not have helped us to bring this up. So I really feel honored to be part of them. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm now open for questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mack. So um, we, can, uh, we can start with questions. I have, uh, I have a question from uh, Mr. Narendra Singh. Uh, it's asking if it's possible to integrate the system with MRI. Uh, whether you can embed MRI? Uh, it's probably asking if it's possible to, yeah, to use MRI uh, um, for the treatment planning. Well, I know already that you can, <laughs> correct? Oh, I mean, for the dose planning itself, CT is man, mandatory due to the fact that we use um, electron densities derived from the Hounsville unit. But we of use course. the MRI sure. for the anatomical definition of uh, all the structures. Yes, that's right. So, um, uh, well, I have two questions myself. So, um, what about, um, what's your experience comparing this system with previous systems you have used about uh, um, the actual treatment time, um, so during delivery, and um, treatment planning time, so the time needed for the treatment planning itself. So what's your impression uh, comparing this system with other system? Is it faster, easier? Um, what was your impression? Well, to the first part of your question, the effective treatment time is composed of an effective beam on time and a time which you need for the setup of the patient and for the travel of the LINAC within the sphere. So the overall time for the first, um, I mean, when the patient comes in until he leaves is roughly between yeah 30 and 45 minutes the effective beam on time is only between 15 and 20 minutes and the rest is just to to you know to position the patient and to allow the linac to address uh, the next node position so that is roughly the time consumption concerning treatment concerning the pli planning time it depends on um, how many loops you want to take. For every loop, it takes you roughly, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes. And then you show the result to the neurosurgeons, radiation oncologist, and he says, okay, maybe you can do a little bit better concerning the constraints, a little bit better to the facial nerve, and you go again. So for every loop, you need maybe 20 minutes. So all together, if you have two, not, two to three tries to really optimize and to end up with a sophisticated dose plan, it accumulates to, let's say, one hour per plan. Well, that's, that's not bad, actually. And um, 
um, do you see advantages in using the 3MV Linux versus the 6MV Linux? Well, I think they used on purpose uh, Linux with a lower energy because they wanted to be close to Cobalt because if you have the same beam arrangement and roughly the same beam quality, the results are probably very, very close to the gamma knife. I think that is the idea. And since you do not need a strong penetration uh, in the brain, uh, 3MV is, is totally enough. Yes, yes, I agree with you. Okay, I don't see any other questions. So, Joan, would you like uh, to proceed with the video eventually? Yes, I'm going to try and pull up the video for you. Let me just do that now. Oh, you see all the video? Can you see it? Yes, I see it. Great. Yes, yes, I see it also. Okay, now you see the 45 centimeters from the source to um, the target. Now, this is a collimator wheel with the different openings, collimator sizes. now you will have the first x-ray fan in blue from different positions and this will be compared to the drrs and then you will have an overlay and the patient position will be um corrected for and now you see the degrees of freedom concerning the couch so the couch will move the patient and thus the, the target which will be moved through the unit center points. Now this is the main axis and now you see the oblique axis and during treatment both axes will spin at the same time. Now you see the different node positions from which the LINAC can direct to the unit center point and the lesion is pulled through the unit center point so now you see some exemplary beams and i think you now understand the principle so now all beams are directed at one nice center and then the patient will be moved to a different position and then you continue all over so this is the the exit dose which will be compared to the pre-calculated dose perfect thank you very much okay thank you thank you dr max so i don't see other questions at the moment so um and thank you for the very interesting presentation and uh, well we hope to hear uh, more in the future thank you again thank you thank you drs romanelli and mac for taking time to support our educational mission we hope you appreciate these webinars and consider supporting the rss by becoming a member